everybody. This is John Blank, Zach's Chief Equity Strategist. And of course, today we're going to go through the third part of selecting top financial sector ETFs. That's the title of this third part, but we have been going through the financial sector for three times. Of course, we're in the midst of a crisis, so this is critical. I want to make sure we go through the disclosures first. These are the views of me, John Blank, PhD, and they are not necessarily the views of Zach's investment research. Keep that in mind. Okay, like I said, we're going to go through selecting the top financial sector ETFs as the third part of our Zach's analysis of financials. We have three parts today. Part one is the top financial sector ETFs. These are critical, and this is the most comprehensive discussion I will give you. We'll spend most of our time on part one. Part two, what does DuPont analysis of bank industry financials show? DuPont analysis is industry specific. It has three parts. The part we'll focus most on, because it's the banks that we're interested in, is leverage. How is leverage being applied? How are people lending in? What is the bank industry telling us about what's going on in the economy? This is an interesting subject for us to learn what the banks think. Part three, of course, we got to talk about these ETFs in the con. Except of the March 2023 bank crisis, obviously we've crossed a Rubicon here. We're in a different world. We need to talk about what the financial sector ETFs can tell us about what people are doing in the face of the March 2023 bank crisis. As I've written, this is done in March 27th, 2023. So first off, of course, the top financial sector ETFs. We've got to get through this. We're going to spend a lot of time here. Okay, so. ETF tables with the top holdings. Of course, over here, we've got XLF, which is the financial sector ETF. Spider, I put these in green, these four. Those are the most important ETFs by assets under management. That's the Spider one. Here's the Vanguard one. This is actually the regional banking one. And then down here is your iShares. So notice this. XLF, BFH, and IYH are going to be largely the same. Big companies, Berkshire Hathaway. JP Morgan, Visa, MasterCard, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Morgan Stanley, S&P Global, Goldman Sachs, BlackRock. Not any real difference here amongst those three. They're basically the same. These are a little cheaper in assets under management. That's why they're so much bigger than IYF. In general, the iShares charge you more. You don't get much out of it. For that, I would stay with XLF or VFH, like pretty much everybody does. Over here, we have the KRE Regional Banking. Of course, these are in play right now. I just want to point out the names here because they're not the ones in the news. New York Community Bank Corps, Citizen Financial, M&T Bank, Regionus Financial, Truist, Huntington, East West, First Horizon, Zions Bank Corps, and Webster. Okay, so over here, you've got the Invesco names. These are very similar to these names. Although this is the Invesco K Key KBW Key Perret and Woods, so they use a different index. They, they're a bank specific investment bank, KBW is. So they have a little bit different names here. FXO, this is your Smart Beta name. I would keep this one in hand for its names because it's using a Smart Beta approach to picking stocks here. So if you're looking to just cherry pick stocks, while not having the asset center manager with the other, this is their this is their their strategy to enter this market first trust. They got some names here that are going to be worth it. All right, EUFN, those are your European banks, MSCI Europe Financial. So of course UBS is in there, HSBC is in there, Alliance is in there, Zurich Insurance and Access. So there's some insurance groups in here. KBE, this is the a different version for the spider banks, just the banks, none of the MasterCards and the visas. Financials, this is Fidelity's play. Fidelity has entered with Spider, Vanguard, and iShares. They are late to the game. They have less under management. Still a very good ETF to look into. And of course, over here is financial services, not banks per se. Of course, that will carry on Visa, MasterCard and things like BlackRock and American Express. So again, here are 10 major ETFs. Know what you're buying, people. You are buying these stocks and know how to cherry pick out of these things. So a critical slide here. Come back to it as you need to. All right, key information ratio. Study these ratios to gain a better understanding of what sells. 
assets under management, expense ratios, inception dates, the segment, and the index applied. So, of course, over here, you're going to get the ticker and the name. But you have to understand all these different issues with this. The other thing I want to point out today is this concept of 30-day SEC yield. This is going to apply particularly with these income, high dividend, and private equity ETFs. As you can see over here, the expense ratios look extremely out of line. This is because they're not management ratios. Those are expense ratios, and they have a certain strategy of providing you yield. So that means you have to look for these specific entities, the 30-day SEC yield. The U.S. SEC has developed a 30-day SEC yield as a standardized method for comparing bond funds. These are effectively bond funds. High dividend yield financials, income stocks for business development corporations, and private equity are basically forms of bond funds in this context. So they should be considered separately, and that's why they're going to stick out. Of course, you're going to get 11% Van Eck income with their SEC bond yield is like 9.8, right? So it's basically a way to get a really nice play into those business development corporations. The high dividend yield, that's, again, effectively what the yield is for the, for the high dividend. Down here, a little different because it's private equity. One thing I just want to point out here, these is why the expense ratios, these are not wrong, but they are characterizing different things. As you can see up here, XLF and VHA have very low expense rates. They're just providing you a very minimal management fee for very, very big large cap stocks. They run on a little different index. It's the S&P financials versus the MSCI, U.S. Investable Market Financials. So that's the little difference here. They're choosing an underlying index that's a little different. And of course, this is the regional bank play. They charge you a little more for that. Uh, it came along a little later in time, 2006, whereas, you know, the XLF's been around since 98. It's one of the early ones. I also drew this line here. This is the top 10. I just want to point out, if you look up here, those are your core cheapy, you know, things that have covered pretty much the landscape of the major indexes. You can see they're all trading on different indexes here. That's what you need to keep applied. The applying of the indexes is key. Then down here, of course, we, we get into stuff that's smaller in assets under management. I love drove that line at, at a billion under management. But you can see basically XLF and VFH are 38 billion in this. I mean, really, they are they're the lion's share of the story. And that's all about being cheap. Down here below this is you're entering in all these specialty ones. Don't throw these away for that reason. Pay more attention to them. There's all kinds of ways to learn more about the business of what the segment is and what the index is and how people are playing these things. It's fascinating. So I really do recommend not skipping. All right. So down here, again, this is the Putman business, BOC income. Again, very different. Global listed private equity. Again, very different. So again, that's the SEC 30-year day bond yield thing. Get involved with that concept. The other thing I want to point out here is those at the very bottom of our AUM table here are also the newest in inception date from 2022 to 2020, 2019. Generally speaking, these are the newest ideas that people have thrown into this market. So again, you can think this is really kind of worth and not worth your time, but pay attention to what people are trying to try now. China financials, India financials, global listed private equity. Right, ultra short financials, 3x inverse, right? 1x long coin, like in Bitcoin, financial services opportunities, no underlying index. Would be fascinating to take a look at this just to see what the names of Gabelli has for you. Gabelli is a famous stock picker. Go in there and take a look at what he's going to offer you in terms of names. You know, all this stuff is what people are throwing at the market now. Covered call and growth ETF. Um, again, take a look at this just to learn what people are trying to throw at this market now in the post-COVID environment. This is worth your time. Just take a look at all of this for a second and learn something about all the different ways that most people don't try, but are there for you to try. And I will also point out when people come at these things with more effort, they charge you more in expenses. That's the trade-off. And you do need to study that. All right, assets under management, 
We're growing after the CPI turn. I just want to point that out here. People were investing in this business up until quite recently. This is the monthly percentage change for the top financial ETFs. I just wanted to point out this right over here. See, I pointed this out here. They were rising out of this turn in the economy. People were thinking the rate rising was going to help these banks until the recession risk and the blowups happened. But of course, KRE, interestingly enough, gained assets under management, the regional banking ones, because they didn't have any of the real nightmare ones. So people moved into something a little safer here just by distributing the risk across better known regional banks. It did get a bit, a bit during this crisis. But the general thing, like I said, as I wanted to point out, this assets under management has grown after the CPI turn. Okay, again, nothing much to hear. I just think this is a lot of noise. Over the last seven years, you can see assets under management tend to be quiet for, you know, the 2018 period. It got very noisy during COVID, right? Of course, people are getting in and out and, and, and have a lot more nervous this period. Now you see the post-COVID environment. We're still not back to this period. It's, it's this kind of less quiet. But, of course, there was, again, here's some issues with the CPI and the rate change and the Fed. All these tight a roll. So you've got basically three periods here, the 2016 to 2019 quiet, the COVID, the post-COVID with some of this showing when the Fed did hike rates and started playing around. So that's what I want people to pay attention to. All right, price earnings ratios. Of course, these are the valuations of these. I want to pour it out. XLF and VFH are right here. And they can you can see that they largely track one another through these periods. And again, this is going to be where the Fed rate hiking starts. And you can see VFH gets a little more of a bid than XLF. Uh, it's probably just for specific to the companies that are in this one versus that one. By and large, they're not any different. I do want to point out here EUFN. This is the European one. So it was actually getting a good bid until 2022, and it fell apart. Right now, there's very little interest in European, although right lately it has come back. I don't know if that's the case now that we have the Credit Suisse thing. This is probably a little dated. Generally speaking, the depressed area of European financials, uh, you know, if you're a value buyer, maybe you pick them up at this low point. But I just want to point out, you know, people have really isolated these valuations into these periods of time, there is the Fed rate hiking period. I also want to point out two different names. Run, R-E-M. This is the one that goes way up and then way, way down. What is this? Of course, it's the mortgage real estate REIT. So during COVID, people bid it up. Now it's collapsing. This needs to be understood. Residential and commercial mortgage real estate mortgage finance is in the doldrums because of the rate hiking. There's just so little business going on here. So REM is, is a specific thing in this industry versus XLF and VFM, which are the big names. And that was, of course, the European name. So REM is a little different. Down here, I want to point out PFI. This is the Investco Financial Momentum ETF. So what you can see here is it was doing fine until we got into this period of post-COVID. For whatever reason, there was some momentum trading, and now there's it's just kind of disappeared. People traded hard in COVID, right? That's the basic point I want to make here. Now they've basically gotten away from it. So plenty to learn here about the price earnings ratios. But I want to point out for all of us who are in banking, price to book matters more. Now I want to also show that I put some lines in here. This is the Fed rate hiking. This is the Fed rate hiking. And this is the Fed rate hiking. So what you can see is before the Fed rate hiking, the much wider distribution of interest in these various ETFs. And now they're all kind of bunching up and staggering around in a tighter pattern. This is true everywhere you look. But I would also point out in this latter period where we got behind the CPI, there was starting to be interest in these industries. You can see all this were getting bid up. First, they weren't bid up at all. And then when we turned the corner on the CPI, they started to get a bid and then it disappeared. But keep it this line here, here, and here. Those are when the Fed started rating high rates. Somewhere in here is when the CPI turned. So you can see, you know, had Powell moved this 
far over, maybe we'd be in a different world. But we aren't. These, this is Powell. This is Powell, Powell, Powell. And of course, you can see that this side is very different than this side. Interesting stuff. All right, relative price performance. I'm just going to show you the top rel relative price performance. So, number one, VFH did actually outperform Vanguard Financials. Keep that in mind. Number here, IAK is the insurance, and this orange line, KIE, is the spider insurance. Insurance was doing well. Those were the top outperformers here. Down here, broker dealers and securities exchanges is another one to get outperformance. And then over here, fascinatingly enough, this is the community bank ETF. Whether this is completely collapsed is likely. Um, I would not trust this data here, but I just want to point out there were trades that were relatively better. The banker financials was better. The insurance companies were doing relatively better. And of course, the broker dealers show a strong, strong difference. Because that might be just equity market related or securities exchange related. Keep in mind, these are sub indexes you can trade and do relatively better as an investor. All right. So I said to you, we're going to go on to the DuPont analysis. But what is DuPont analysis? I put together a good slide to learn what it's all about at a high level. DuPont analysis can be called DuPont identities, DuPont equations, DuPont frameworks, DuPont models, or DuPont methods. It breaks down the return on equity. Remember, we're investing in equity. We want to know the return on equity. The DuPont analysis goes into three parts. It's been around for 100 years, maybe longer. First of all, number one, profitability. This is typically important when there's high margin industries and in the industry, there's certain groups, for example, fashion, where high-end fashion gets higher margins. This will allow us to figure out what different companies are doing strategy-wise versus profitability. Asset efficiency. It's like a same source sales thing. This is typically very helpful for retail, just, just you know, studying retail things. The final one is one we're going to focus on today is financial leverage. This is very important in the financial sector as Leverage, high leverage generates higher returns on equities. It also creates, of course, in this bank crisis, some issues. So let's keep our minds on the DuPont analysis today. Since we're talking about the financial sector, we will focus on financial leverage, not profitability and asset efficiency. So let's get going. Again, five components to the return on equity, the tax burden, the interest burden, the operating margin, the asset turnover, and of course, the leverage. I put these red lines between the leverage and ROE. Like I said, that's our focus today. So let's get into this. Now the top row shows us code 48 finance. That's the Vanguard, Fannie Freddie, office property. This is not interesting, I'm gonna skip it. Down here is where it gets interesting. BRT apartments, the apartments, they are growing in ROE lately, and they have increased leverage, not so bad. So apartments look good. Natural resources, FOR, again, not really seeing some growth or turn to leverage. The leverage is going up. The ROEs are going up. These two, you can see, are doing pretty well. Natural resources and apartments, of course, BRT apartments. We should think about that because people are living in apartments more often. Now, here we got some interesting problems here. This is the lodging trust. Those are the hotels. And these are the office properties. So these are very different ideas of concern. And you can see right now, if we look at who's got the highest leverage in these businesses, it's going to be the apartments. Then it's going to be the natural resources, and then down here, we're going to have less leverage being applied. Of course, what's happening here, people are buying these, one of the banks are trying to, to increase their leverage in natural resources and apartments. Those are the plays right now. The lodging and the office properties are not the place. So again, if we're looking into real estate, 52, critical separation between apartments and natural resources and lodging and office, these are what I'll stay away from. These we want to get into. Okay. All right. On the top row is the banks and thrifts. On the bottom row is the investment bankers and managers. So bottom row, Oppenheimer, Silvercrest managers, a company called Highwind, which is in China. 
we're going to not spend a lot of time here because this is this really a different business. This is investment managers and bankers. Up here, this gets interesting. We are talking banks here. So who do, should we worry about? I just want to point out that in general, for example, Horizon Bank Corps was not over leveraged. People's Bank Corps was not over leveraged. FLIC, which is first of Long Island, was not over leveraged. And then this one is rank, ranking itself up, Home Bank Corps. If I looked into Home Bank Corps, this would be the one I'd be worried about. It turns out they are in Louisiana, they're relatively new business. And so a lot of this is because they're starting up their business. This should be discounted because of the nature of the situation with Home Bank Corps. So by and large, we can't learn a lot here from this slide. I just want to point out the banks and thrifts at the top would have been somewhere we could have learned something. Wasn't a lot there. And you can see how different it is. Leverage in these securities businesses are really, really different. And they change all over the place. And I don't think we can use this as a good analysis. I would spend more of my time on the operating margins down here. Some of them are quite substantial. All right, let's keep moving. Here we go to a different set of industries. This is the insurance companies right here. And again, major banks, but they're mainly outside the United States down here. I just want to point one that I found that could be concerning, which is Western New England Bank, or a very small company, but you can see they've increasing their leverage to get their ROE up. This would be one where I would be worried about because they're small enough and they've increased their leverage. So I found one, obviously, it's not a very big one. I'm not going to take the U.S. economy down, but WNEB, Western New England Bank Corps, has been definitely raising the leverage. Now, this is not, should not be surprising. After a COVID environment, these groups could have expanded aggressively in their neighborhoods because there's such a small base that would happen. Now, there's other types of businesses here that are worth talking about. This is a foreign trade finance business. This is a Argentinian bank. This is a Chilean bank. Up here, these are different groups of insurance companies. Again, not really applicable. I would stay on this row and I would basically focus on Western New England Bank. Again, we're just trying to learn something about the difference between leverage and ROE. And you can see the more leverage, the higher return on equity for banking systems. This is the key insight here that you can apply across all three of these slides. All right, so finally, let's get into what happened in the financial sector ETFs during the banking crisis. Everything changed or nothing changed, let's get into it. First off, IAT did see a bid and increasement. That is the regional banking group. So at first, they didn't get sold off much. They actually got bought and rose because these were the safer ones. This is the safe haven within the banking industry. FAZ, SEF and COIN were basically strategies of shorting. These were leverage ETFs. You can see how tough this was. First, it was way up, and then it was way down. First, it was way up. You, of course, you shorted it. You got it right, but you also got it wrong a week or two later. And Coinbase, you know, urge early on, it wasn't a big deal, but there was a bid in the COIN out of the regional bank collapse issues. So COIN got bid up. So this is interesting here. The trading stories are here. People who were trading had really different strategies versus uh, non-traders, because this is just over a few weeks. And you can see, actually, there was a lot of money to be made if you got these trades, not investments right. All right, let's get into this final one. Here is equity global financials. The biggest outflow was from the global financials. And it really did take AUM down from 700 to 600. The yes, 150. So there was a huge pullout of ETF exposure to the global financials in the last couple of weeks. That really did happen. Now, over here, we got some inflows, BMO and Granite shares. To my knowledge, these are some shorting and single stock ETFs that have people were playing who are traders, so they added a little more. But the numbers are substantially less than over here. Equity Global Financials, of course, was massive. People got out. So we do see some change in the way people are looking at this industry. People are scared. Uh, that needs to be understood. All right. Thanks for attending. I hope you enjoyed it today. Here's how you can get these slides from us, 866-794-6065. Or email us at strategycall at zaxpro.com or go to the web at zaxpro.com. 
We're also on LinkedIn at Zach's Professional Services on Twitter at, at ZA Tools. Anything to do, though, just give us a call. That's the easy way to do it. Thanks a bunch, and I hope you enjoyed it.